Hi and welcome. We're at Psychology 2. We're going to look at social psychology. Now social psychology is a separate division of psychology and it looks at you know the role that other people play in our own sense of the sense of self and development. So this whole segment I'm going to do two-part video. The first part we're going to look at a variety of things related to social psychology at the introduction components and we'll look at some of the research that's been done in that area. And then we'll move into psych uh, the part two and we'll just follow up with the continuation of what we did in part one. So let's get right at this because this might be a little bit meaty because it's a big topic and we're only doing it in one week. So I'm gonna do two videos that will be posted in the same week in week seven. So good luck with this and I hope you really enjoy it because it's quite an interesting topic. Now psycho uh, social psychology is defined in three main areas of interest. Now, if you look at the definition, attempts to explain the actual, imagined, or implied presence of others that influence the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of individuals. So it's not even just the actual presence, um, but the implied or imagined. If I think they're there or you're being told they're there, that that can influence my thoughts, my feelings, and my behaviors. And social psychology studies that, and it's quite an interesting kind of the work that's been done, and we'll look at this. Social psychologists are interested in how variables within society, uh, individuals contribute to their responses to social influence, and that we don't all respond to social influences the same. So what are the things that influence us? Group variables, that is to say, how people you, you don't know and those you do associate with can influence your behavior. And then thirdly, interactions among individuals and group variables shape our behavior. So let's look at some of the elements about what is social psychology. The process we use to obtain critically important social information about others is what's called social perception. And a key ingredient to that is the primacy effect. This is the tendency of an overall impression to be influenced by more than by more than uh, sorry influenced more by our first information that is received by any information that comes after that so essentially our first impression has a powerful impact in terms of our overall impression of somebody the information that is consistent with the first impression is often accepted it strengthens the impression inconsistent information is usually disregarded so if i get a bad impression of you at first and then the other information I hear and see of you after is good, I'm likely to reject the good and accept the first impression, as are you and everybody else. When you're asked to name your qualities, you list your positive qualities first because that's what you want people to see. And now, unfortunately, our first impressions are made extremely quickly, in microseconds. A firm handshake makes a powerful first impression, conveys the person is confident and outgoing. You need to present all of yourself in a positive way in order to make that first impression because it happens so quickly. Mood affects impressions. When we're happy, our impressions of others are usually more positive. Now, there's an element in our perception, the way we explain other people in our own behavior, that's called attributions. This is the assignment that we make of others or ourselves about the cause to explain like I said, either our behavior or someone else's behavior. And there's two types of attributions. There's situational and dispositional. Situational attribution is when we attribute a behavior to some external cause or some factor. After failing exam, you say, well, the test was unfair. So that's situational. It was the test that caused my failure. It wasn't anything within me. That was situational. You know, that was not me personally. Whereas dispositional attribution is when we attribute a behavior to some internal cause, a personal trait, a motive, or an attitude. After failing the exam, you say, I'm no good at school. This demonstrates, if you will, a disposition attribution about your lack of ability. And so one is an internal cause. It's something within you that's caused it. It's a trait. It's an attitude. Whereas situational is more about the circumstances and something outside of you that may have influenced your dis you know, your, your uh, thoughts or your behaviors. Now, when we carry this all forward, um, we can look at further with attributions, and there's some different effects here. There's an actor-observer effect. 
The tendency to attribute one's own shortcoming to situational factors and the behaviors of others to dispositional. And so there's a tendency whenever something goes badly for us or goes well, we, tr we attribute it positively to us. Or if, if it goes badly, well, it was situational. If it was good, it's dispositional. Where if it happens to somebody else, it's dispositional. Or sorry, it's, it's um, uh, dispositional, yes. You know, it's them, it's their trade. It's the reason why they were a failure is because they are a failure. And so there's a tendency to do that. Um, Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland, each one attributes the violence to the other group. They're all murderers and evil. Each justifies their own violence with situational causes. We have to protect ourselves from the evil ones. And so this is this putting it on them as, as dispositional and applying it to us as situational. Now, what's called a fundamental attribution error is the tendency to attribute others' behavior as dispositional. It's fundamental because they are just as much an individual as you are. And if you will treat yourself as it's situational, by putting it on everybody else that's dispositional makes it a fundamental, a basic attribution error. They too may have situational reasons, not have everything be dispositional. Now, having self-serving bias is something we're all probably familiar with. This tendency to attribute our successes to dispositional causes is because I'm just great. And our failures to situational, somebody else is having an effect on me. Athletes attribute success to skill, and failure to poor officiating. Now carrying on with the um, some focal points of social psychology, one is factors that influence uh, factors that influence attraction. Now one of those influences is proximity and another is exposure. And we'll look at the difference. Proximity is the physical or geographical closeness. It's easier to make friends with people who are close at hand. So you look at people in your class, that's easier to make friends with people in your class because of proximity than necessarily people in other programs. The mere exposure effect is the tendency to feel more positively towards stimulus as a result of repeated exposure to it. So the more exposure you have to people in your class when you first meet them, you don't have very much exposure to them, but because you see them every day, you start to have more exposure to them, so you start to feel more positive towards many of the people in your class. Advertisers rely on it to influence people, uh, to influence them about food, um, songs, and clothing, and styles. The more exposure you have to these things, the more likely you are to like them. We tend to pick friends on the same age, gender, race, and socioeconomic class. Mere exposure effect. We tend to choose friends and lovers with similar views on things that are most important to us. Again, mere exposure effect. Similar interests and attitudes towards leisure activities make leisure time activities, time spent with each other, more rewarding when we have people who like what we like. Physical attractiveness, that people of all age have a strong tendency to prefer physical attractive people. Six-month-old infants spend more time looking at photos of attractive people. Now, symmetry, symmetrical faces and bodies are more attractive than sexual and, and sexually appealing. There's a correlational uh, relationship of 9.93 correlation among Asian, Hispanic, and African American and white females on attractiveness ratings. That the more symmet symmetrical a face and body is, the more attractive these different groups have found them to be in studies. Now, one of the things that's been found is what's called the halo effect. And this is the tendency to assume that a person has generally positive or negative traits after observing one major positive or negative trait. Now, the two images that I have there are people who generally have done one or two positive things, but because everything that they are associated with, we tend to assume that it's a positive trait. That's why it's called a halo effect. Now, when we consider attraction, romantic attraction in mating, there's a hypothesis, it's called matching hypothesis and people tend to have lovers or spouses who are similar to themselves in physical attractiveness and other assets mismatched couples are more likely to end the relationship a fear of rejection keeps many from pursuing mismatched attractiveness similarities have the most influence when it comes to personality physical traits intelligence religion ethnicity social economic status and attitudes 
the reality is that opposites don't necessarily attract, but what draws people together the most are people we find similar to ourselves. Now, a very big area that social psychology has spent a lot of time in their research is on conformity, the changing or adopting behavior or attitudes in an effort to be consistent with what the social norms of a group are and the expectations of other people. Now, a lot of people don't assume themselves to be particularly strong conformers, and yet research suggests we're very strong conformers. Now, what a social norm is, is the attitude and standards of behavior expected of a member of a particular group. Some conformity is necessary for society to function. Um, driving on the right side of the road in, the, in Canada is kind of important, and I just sort of depend on that social norm. That when I leave my house, I don't have to worry about someone driving down the other side of the road. We conform to many of these guidelines that help make society run effectively. Teens who attend school where a majority of students don't drink or smoke are less likely to use substances themselves. Conforming to others' expectations to have their esteem, approval, or friendship, love, or company. And that's often why we will do, we will conform. Now, there's been a lot of studies that have been done. Um, Selman Ausch uh, did a study that um, you're seeing on the slide there. And it's a tendency to go along with the majority has, uh, is not altered by the number of confederates. Now, confederates are people who are a part of the experiment. And so what you're seeing on the um, top right is this line, or standard line. And one of these um, on the standard line matches one, two, and three matches the standard line. And if there's six people sitting down in a row, five of them are confederates, people who are in on this. One is the person being experimented on. And so when they're asked to find the other stick, one, two, or three, that matches the standard line, the five people say the wrong answer, the, the sixth, well, they don't know what to do because they see what they think is the right answer and they tend to conform. And so that's been a, a, a well-proven study that people will conform in spite of what they know to be right. However, if one person voices dissent, if one of the other five people says it's number two, then conformity is not as strong. 32% versus 10.4%. Now, it's a very high rate of conformity uh, 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 when it comes to uh, this test and other tests that have been done. Now, there is another element that's called, and one of the risks of conformity is what's called group thing, think. Members of a tight-knit group are more concerned with preserving group solidarity and uniformity than with objectively evaluating all alternatives of decision-making. Now, I have the challenger image up there in the crew because part of what was the cause of this explosion was a group think. The group was more interested in meeting the group um, objective of getting the launch off on time than they were on identifying what somebody had identified was one problem with the, um, the space shuttle. And if they had dealt with that problem, this accident may not have happened, but they didn't. They moved along with the objective, which was to get this launch on time. Now, another experiment that took an awful lot, has an awful lot of, uh, uh, um, um, notoriety is the Milgram experiment and he did his experiment on obedience why are people obedient now when we talk about you know why he did this experiment he was um, it was around the time of the um, the war with Nazi Germany and most people in society there must obey the rules and respect authority if society is to survive but the unquestioned obedience can cause unbelievable horrific acts and this is what happened in Nazi Germany and the order of extermination of Jews. So Milgram was wondering, well, how does that happen? How do people get so obedient to a person? So his an experiment was surprising. You see it there on the image. He would have a teacher and a learner. The teacher would have a electronic board, which you see in the top left-hand side, and every time that the learner got something wrong, he would give him an electric shock. But they're in separate rooms. And the learner really is not hooked up to the electric shock machine, but the teacher doesn't know that. The experimenter continues to let the person, the teacher, know to keep going in spite of his objections. What they find is that 60% of the participants will deliver a maximum voltage despite the pleading. The pleading is coming from the learner. Now, again, he's not attached. 
but he screams out in discomfort as the electric shocks get more. And they are told that a person could die with the maximum uh, electric shock, and yet 60% will deliver the um, maximum voltage. No one checked on the victim without asking permission. Additional studies confirm that, Mil that Milgram's findings, they have continued in a rundown building instead of a lab, uh, Yale laboratory, 48% delivered the maximum. The point is that the experimenter is looking like the authority because they had a lab jacket and a stethoscope and a flipboard. And so they made that appear like they had the authority, but in fact they had no, they couldn't make you do anything and yet most people would do that. Now we move to a related of compliance. Um, this is acting in accordance with the wishes, suggestions, or direct requests of other people. Now when it comes to um, marketing and salespeople, this is partly what they'll use as techniques. One is the foot and door technique, a strategy designed to gain favorable response to a small request at first, intended to get the person to agree to our larger requests later. And it's called the foot and door technique, and it's one way you get compliance. Get them to agree to open the door for you, get them to agree to have you be invited in, and then if you introduce larger requests, you've already got their agreement to start, so they, you, you increase the likelihood they're going to con continue to um, comply. The door and face technique, someone takes a large, unreasonable uh, request, expects the person was going to refuse it, and then the person will be more likely to agree to a smaller request later. You know, will you be willing to invest $2,000 in this piece of paper? Well, of course not. Well, how about $500 in this card? Hmm, that sounds more realistic. That's the door and face technique. And then the lowball technique for compliance and getting people to abide by your request or, or, or uh, your, your suggestion would be uh, the lowball technique. Someone makes a very attractive initial offer to get the person to commit to an action and then makes the terms less favorable after the commitment. So you get them to start in something low and then you add different condi conditions that um, if you had introduced them first, they would likely have not been interested. And so these are all parts of you know, how we can use um, uh, techniques to build in things like conformity, obedience, and compliance. So what influence does the group have on us? If I'm in a group, can they influence what I do and what I think? Well, one of them is what's called social facilitation. Social facilitation is any positive or negative effect on the performance that can be attributed to the, to the presence of others, either as an audience or co-actors. Now, the audience effect is that the, it's the impact of passive spectators on a performance. When I was working as a behavior consultant, it was very common that if someone started to misbehave among other people, it was the audience that sometimes the other people who sometimes maintain the behavior because that person who was acting out didn't want to lose face. So the audience can influence what happens to the individual. Now the co-action effect, this is the impact on performance caused by presence of other people engaged in the same task. Bike racers pedal faster against racers than against the clock. If you've ever watched bike races, they have what's called the peloton. And the peloton is a group of cyclists. It stays together as a group. In part, even though I get tired, I'm in amongst the group. I get the benefit of a, a, a wind protection. But it's the camaraderie and the effect of other people being there that facilitates my benefit, my, 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 my uh, cycling. Now, with social facilitation, uh, the performance, performance that we have, uh, that we do in the presence of others, this is a quick little chart that sort of demonstrates... Um, social facilitation. Now when we look at group influence there's a other side not just social facilitation but there's social loafing. The tendency to exert less effort when working with others and when working alone. It occurs in situations where a person con person's contribution to the group can can be identified. Individuals are neither praised nor uh, for good performance nor blamed for for poor ones the workplace problem, especially when there is unlimited internet access, it can be a real ease for social loafing. Achievement motivation um, levels may facilitate social loafing. Low achievement motivation, individuals contribute little when paired with hard workers. 
did the opposite did the opposite when paired with those who didn't work very hard so social loafing can work if there's a large number of people i don't think i need to work very hard because others will do the work what else can affect through group influence well social roles um, social roles are socially defined behaviors considered appropriate for individuals occupying certain positions within a group. So for example, an officer can influence a group's behavior based on the social role that they perform. A doctor can, a teacher can. Um, can, you know, that they can shape the behavior quickly and dramatically or positively or negatively. Now the term de-individualization or de-individuation de is a process in which individuals lose their sense of personal identity as a result of identification with the group. Now, for example, um, Vancouver uh, um, goes through the Stanley Cup and the outcome uh, got people all riled up and as a result had a demonstration and a riot going on in downtown Vancouver that set police cars on fire. Well, de-individuation de where some of those people had no intention of ever doing that, but found themselves doing something when they felt like as if they weren't a part, you know, they weren't acting individually. They were acting as a part of a group. And then lastly, for this first part, we'll look at um, the Zimbardo experiment, where we looked at an experiment where students were selected randomly um, for an experiment on social roles and it demonstrated the negative effect of social roles. Participants role-played prisoners and guards so well that the study ended in only six days. Zimbardo simulated the prison environment by randomly assigning participants to the social roles of guards and inmates, and the social roles influenced the participants' behaviors. The prisoners began acting like real prisoners and the guards like real prison guards. Now I'm going to post that video for you as well as um, Milgram's and um, Ausch's uh, experiment for you in that folder and you can look at them if you like. All right, that's the end of part one and we'll do part two and then we're done in week seven. So good luck with this.